Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is David Worthley. I'm the Virtual Conferences Director at IORMA. I welcome you to this event and uh, just say a few brief words about IORMA and the purpose of this webinar. Well, the IOMA Global Consumer Commerce Centre, it's a neutral resource for businesses and governments that recognise the need to understand and respond to the ways in which the 7.8 billion global consumers are changing in the products and services that they want and need and the ways in which they want to obtain them. Uh, and these changes are happening globally, driven by developments in society, in business, and in technology. Now we have an excellent uh, panel this afternoon to, dis to discuss bringing food production into the cities. Uh, before I hand over to the moderator for this session, just to remind you, please use the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of your screen to type in any questions rather than the, uh, the, 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 the chat button. Um, and so, if you can do that, we will have a very smooth and successful afternoon. So without uh, further ado, I'm now going to hand over to uh, Dr. Richard Baines, who is your moderator for this session. Okay, just unmuting myself. Thank you, David, for that introduction. And welcome everyone to, to this uh, webinar, looking at bringing food to the cities. Uh, just a few comments um, why I'm interested in this. First of all, I'm a, a senior academic at the Royal Agricultural University, which has had many years of looking at producing food on the land, and more recently becoming interested in how food is grown closer to cities and what the connections are. Uh, I'm also a, a, an independent consultant doing a lot of work on local food models, which does include urban and peri-urban. In setting the scene for this uh, webinar, um, I want to just make a couple of points. I think the first one is that uh, 2007 was a very unique year in human history in that more people became urban than rural. And I think also by the time we moved to 2050, some two thirds of the world's population, some 6.5 billion people, would be living in an urban context. Um, and maybe that won't be the urban context that you and I know. A significant proportion of those are gonna be living in very difficult conditions with limited access to food. Uh, for example, uh, urbanization and food supply is mainly going to be a, a developing world urban problem as we look at the, where the increasing population is going to occur. So it's not only about bringing food in, but it's how we manage food within the city, how we manage the waste, how we maintain safety. Um, and to that extent, what ways can technology add to that system? And I think that's going to become part of what we're going to explore in this webinar. But before we do, I'd like to introduce you uh, to the panelists who will be responding to questions. Um, and I think I'll start, first of all, by introducing Jamie Burrows and asking Jamie just to say a few words about yourself and your interests and how it relates uh, to this webinar. Hello. Hi, Richard. Thank you very much for the, uh, the introduction and thanks to IOMA for, uh, for having me today. Uh, my name is Jamie Burrows and I'm the founder and CEO of Vertical Future. We're a London-based technology company that has been growing uh, produce for about uh, four years, um, primarily selling to, to restaurants and, and homes across London and the UK. And in the last 18 months following um, a funding round, we've, we've evolved more into a technology and R&D company uh, developing fully automated um, turnkey vertical farming solutions to sell across the world. Okay, thank, thanks very much. Um, I'd like to now move on to uh, Oscar. If you could introduce yourself and your interests and backgrounds, please. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Oscar Rodriguez. I am an architect and um, a director of a specialist consultancy called Architecture and Food. Um, I'm also the policy director for UK UAT, UK Urban Agritech. Um, I guess I'm interested in the architecture of introducing uh, food production, um, particularly technology enabled food production into the city where the technology offers a level of productivity that helps to close that land value gap um, 
and and therefore enables it to sort of fulfill a range of functions, be it sub, like high tech subsistence through to some sort of commercial plan. Um, that's about it. Thank you very much, Oscar. Um, moving on now, I'd like to introduce uh, Peter, who's coming uh, to talk to us about his new ideas. Peter, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Peter. I'm the CEO of a company called Floating Farm. As you can see here in the back <laughs> of my picture, uh, it's floating over here in the port of Rotterdam. Um, we're trying to produce food as close as we can get to consumers inside cities, as Richard already mentioned in his introduction. Finding space inside cities is, uh, is quite a challenge. We can do it on roofs, we can do it in caves, but we choose for the water. And I think we will deep dive a little bit more into that aspect later on. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And finally, last but not least, can I introduce uh, you to Chris? Chris, could you introduce yourself? your links and your interests, please. Absolutely. So my name is Chris Lyons. I work for Innovate UK, government's innovation agency. Um, I'm a lead on agriculture. Um, and I'm really interested in this subject. You know, what we're looking at at Innovate UK is you know, how we can bring forward a sustainable, resilient and carbon zero um, food production system moving forward. And this subject is, is right up there and obviously all the innovation that works around that. Thank you. Good, thank you very much. So folks, that's the panel who are going to uh, offer their views on this interesting topic. Can I remind you that uh, as we go through the discussion, there will be an opportunity for you to post questions in the Q&A that we can pick up towards the end. So just to kick off this afternoon's session, I'd like to pose a question to Oscar first of all and ask him to maybe comment on the percentage of new buildings in an urban environment that could possibly employ technologies to integrate high-tech food uh, into their design. Uh, this is an easy one, 100%. 100% percent <laughs> of new buildings could do it because there are so many ways in which you could do it that you could easily afford a square meter in the corner of your room. You can put in a few hydroponic trays, interlayer it with some LED lights, and you could grow your own salads. If you're concerned about the cost of doing that, then you could probably arrange some planters on your balcony. You could definitely get together some PVC pipe, arrange it into a zigzag, put a pump into a tank of water and flow some nutrient solution with it, into it, and then pop, uh, plant little sort of plants into it. Um, and, and then maybe even put it up against some floor to ceiling, south facing glazing. Uh, I, think, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to sort of on a point with that. I, th I think what you're talking about so far, as, as I'm reading, it, is really what, what I'd call sort of uh, uh, individual or small group retrofitting. Perhaps another way of asking this question might be what proportion of buildings are designed to to take this as being a part of the of the of the functional design of the building, either buildings to grow food for, hum for the population, buildings that integrate it, or buildings that are gonna create the raw materials going in to grow the things. So slightly larger scale. Well, I mean, it could be larger scale, but why concentrate on larger scale? I mean, it's, uh, the, the point is there, there are so many ways of doing it, so many ways of integrating it. Ultimately, what you need is nutrient, sunlight, water. And cities have that in abundance. They have the infrastructure already there. They have capacity to be able to do it. Um, the question is design. And ultimately, the, 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 the real, I guess, barrier <clears throat> is whether or not we're willing to live alongside it. And that is something that since the introduction of the railways, we've rejected. And urban, was, uh, urban became urban, rural became rural, and never the two shall mix. Now, given the pressures on globalized industrial agriculture, we're starting to think, okay, maybe we should redress this relationship and uh, and seek to erode this hyper consumptive urban meta like um, situation that we've got at the moment uh, particularly in countries like the UK where we're so food import dependent that it's mm. becoming a problem covid naturally has um, raised the stakes on that pressure um, and so it it really is a call to designers, particularly urban designers, to start thinking 
uh, about what excess capacity the city offers, but also about for urbanites. We should be engaging more with our food, uh, yeah, understanding yeah. where it comes from and understanding the value of it. So one way of doing that is by growing it yourself or growing it with your neighbors or growing it in a community or engaging with a, a, a local farm. That's good. But I think when you're saying about the, the, you know, the design of it, I think from my point of view, I, I think there's also a need for um, urban planning to focus on, um, on food as a fundamental part of, of urban planning. And when you plan food, you have to also plan food waste and water and all the rest of it. I think some, we're missing that integrated planning concept around food, aren't we? So that's one of the policy drives we've got at UK UAT, where we're going to approach the planning use Good. class issue uh, for urban farms. Now, again, there are so many ways that you can grow in the city. It, it goes from low to high tech. It goes from intensive to you know, different degrees of intensity, different yeah. growing technologies. Um, and each one of those kind of needs a, an enabling framework around it that is represented in the use class. Um, furthermore, further down the line, there's a land reform component, because ultimately, if, if, if we are to grow food should in the city, should, should those operations not benefit from the same sort of subsidy regime that rural producers do? Um, and that's going to be a, quite a challenge, quite a conflict, but it's nevertheless... Um, if, if, if it results in uh, more resource efficiency, more effectiveness, i.e., you, you know, more price stability, better quality, fewer pesticides, then it's worth doing. Good. Can I just ask if any other panelists want to make a comment uh, around any of these areas? You want to just raise your hand so that we can get you on screen, uh, or are you okay to move on? Yeah, Peter's got a comment uh, on this yeah. question. Well, it's, it's more uh, backing up uh, the story of Oscar, actually, because uh, as we call it, we think we're going from an economy of scale, as we all learned in the past, to what we call economy of cities. And economy of cities means that you need to design um, small scale, that you need to make it lightweighted, uh, different materials, um, sustainable, uh, other energy consumptions. So it will be from, from, from big scale to small scale. Um, uh, I think that is a very important uh, move that we will see inside cities and city developments. Um, we often use the word, if you see how cities will be transformed, we call it not transformation, but we call it transformation. You put a farm <laughs> good, good. As, a, as an essential element in city development, because as, um, as Oscar also mentioned, it's also about engagement, about awareness, about seeing the process, feeling the process, smelling the process, because we are talking about one of the most essential elements in life that is healthy food. So it should be a part of our life. It should be a part of our life inside cities. And that's why we call it transformation. Put the farm back uh, where it belongs, close to people. Good. Actually, I think, um, Peter, as you came to that, I'd like to come to you with the next question now, which uh, goes on from what Oscar said, where, where you're looking at your floating farm concept um, and that's got a, a sense of scale with it. So would you like to sort of share with us your idea and what you mean by your floating farm? I think the, uh, the audience would be very interested to hear and see what you're doing. Well, maybe um, if you allow me, Richard, um, and if the technology allows me, we assembled a few drone pictures uh, that we made last week. Uh, we assembled it into a little video. There's no sound to it, but maybe it explains a bit uh, about our farm. So if you allow me, I can share my screen and start a little video. Would that be okay for you? Please do that. And if you want to talk to, talk to any of the slides as you're going through, that'd be great. Okay, let's see. So I start um, this drone video uh, we made uh, last week. I hope uh, everybody can see yeah. it. We're all seeing uh, that. We're here great. now Thank in you. Uh, the port of Rotterdam. Here you can see a three layer building. So it, it has uh, three layers with uh, a stable on top and a processing layer in between and a floating part underneath the water. It's um, almost fully powered by, uh, by solar energy. As you can see, we have floating solar panels next to the farm. Um, this is a shot of the cows. So the cows, we have 40 cows running in our farm on our uh, top level. The, they're open, um, there's an open bridge. They can go to a little meadow if they like, they can choose themselves. 
we feed the cows with all kinds of residual streams from the city and, and turn it into fresh dairy like yogurt and milk and butter, of course. Um, for us, um, it's an important uh, issue if you, find, if you want to find space inside cities uh, to look into the water, also because it's very much related to, to climate change. Uh, many cities are having water, uh, so let's use it in a smart way. Uh, so this was a little bit to show to everybody how it looks like and where it is positioned in the port of Rotterdam. That's quite interesting because I can remember many years ago reading an article in the Sunday Times of one of the first apartment blocks in Rotterdam that actually had a cow on the roof supporting the residents. And that's many years ago, I can't think how many years ago, that there was an interest even then in looking at that. I think as well, uh, Peter, that uh, you know, one, of the, one of the ways in which uh, uh, in the Netherlands that you have a, a great advantage in terms of your agriculture and food production is your ability to really um, be innovative with technology. Can you just, within your, your vertical farm, your floating farm, can you just sort of summarize any uh, unique bits of technology you think that you're really proud of within that? Uh, sure. So, um, we, so we, we apply a high tech inside the farm. Um, that is for several reasons, because uh, with what we see happening uh, in the Netherlands and probably all over Europe is that young people are leaving the countryside to move towards cities. Uh, they don't want to take over the, uh, not, not everybody of course, but a lot of people, young people don't want to take over the farm anymore. They want to move into cities. They want to, to be engaged. And so what we did over here was implement some kind of robots, many robots actually, and also uh, well, not make it gamification, but make it attractive to young people to work over here. So we implemented milking robots, manure robots, feedstock robots, all kinds of stuff like that. <laughs> and, and, and make it almost possible to, to, to manage it from your, from your phone, from your smartphone. So make it very attractive to, uh, to young people to, to be here. That's one thing. The other thing is, uh, like Oscar said, if you can design food production in a architectural, in a more iconic way to make it attractive, to become proud that you're working in a very high tech modern farm instead of dark and brown and smelly and <laughs> dirty maybe. So, so that, that's what we try to do over here. So finding space, but also make it attractive to become part of this uh, by using robot technology, but also the design is, is, is different than a regular farm. I think that's uh, an interesting point in, in terms of my work with uh, emerging agriculture and emerging economies. Often the challenge we face is how can we um, how can we make agriculture and food production an entrepreneurial activity rather than something that's just going to break your back? Um, <laughs> so technology can help with that. And I think that's important. I'd like to now go on to Jamie, because I'd like to explore the technology of, of farming within the urban context um, in terms of the work you're doing on vertical farming. And really, this is to start to ask questions about what you can produce uh, and how you can quantify that and what the, the key benefits would be. You're on mute, mute again at the moment, Jamie. Uh, there we go. I'm good. Far away. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Thanks. Uh, let me just change the screen. So um, maybe just to, to, to kind of give a, an overview from our perspective on, on, um, on vertical farming. So with the, the way we come at it is, is from a controlled environment agriculture uh, based approach. So obviously vertical farming going back to... Uh, Oscar's comments earlier can be very, very broad. Um, we, we fully believe that everybody should be growing what they can for themselves, but we fundamentally believe um, that the, the world is a risk. There are a lot of uh, troubling things happening. Uh, if you watched uh, David Attenborough's recent um, program on um, extinction and the fact that uh, you know, one third of uh, soil globally has been degraded, um, insects are at threat, um, we need to find other solutions. Now, vertical farming is not a silver bullet, and it's certainly not something which is going to replace uh, traditional farming uh, now, in the future, whenever, because purely the amount of uh, infrastructure you'd have to put in place would be um, ridiculous and, and, and not really achievable. And secondly, vertical farms can only grow a, a limited range of, of, of products because of the design of them. Um, 
from a technology angle, the way that we see ourselves as being very different and the way that we've approached the market. So we, we spent um, a number of years running uh, vertical farms in London using um, what I would say kind of standard vertical farming technologies, rigid bench uh, systems, one type of lighting. And we just, we, we felt that the unit economics didn't quite work. So um, we, we took a long time to, to kind of sit back and, and think about how we would, would design um, the best vertical farming system that's not, not just the best, but that's affordable for people, for the mass market. So for us, you know, vertical farming should be something which should be um, approachable for not just developed markets and premium produce, but also, you know, developing markets and, and, uh, and very rural areas. So, um, so for us, vertical farming is about geometry. And if you look at traditional vertical farming systems and many that, you're, um, that we're seeing at the minute, there's this kind of race to the bottom in that people, if you look at um, regions like the UAE, where you know, they're importing 90, 95% of their produce, people are trying to build systems very, very quickly, um, but they're not necessarily the best systems. They don't uh, address many of the, the operational and capex associated issues um, that, that every business must, must face. So for example, very limited automation. Uh, they're, they're very inflexible. So if you think about um, vertical farming from, a, from an infrastructure-based standpoint, almost like a PFI type, uh, type program, we, we foresee there being um, massive issues probably in the next five to 10 years because a lot of these vertical farms are gonna to have to recapitalize their assets because they're gonna find that they're, they're inflexible, that the, the assets are gonna be degrading and so on. So our, our system, what we focused on is, is developing a, a effectively a system that moves on three axes. Um, and we don't think about things on a meter, meter squared basis. We think about things in terms of volume, meter cubed. So throughout the entirety of the production process, our products are moving. Um, and we, for example, it's, it's very difficult to, to explain, which is why I put it on, um, on screen, but every, every 12 hours, we work on 12 hour crop cycles our systems alternate and, and um, basically open up new layers of production, as well as moving on the x-axis and, uh, and z-axis. And because, um, because of the way that we've designed these systems to be space efficient, they're not just good for urban areas, they're also good for rural areas, but you don't need humans, you don't need aisles. Um, so you're, you're, you're saving on OPEX there, but you're, you're maximizing the total amount of space that you could dedicate to, uh, to production in any given footprint. Um, so really, it's just about flexibility. And then um, from a data standpoint, we see uh, vertical farming as being very, um, very early, early days in terms of good, rich, published data uh, that can substantiate claims. So we've, we've worked really hard to develop a, a SaaS product which integrates with our system. So uh, in, in short, whoever's operating the farm can remotely um, you know, monitor and control effectively what's going on down to every one quarter of a square meter throughout the facility. Uh, our lighting systems can um, play tunes with obviously, uh, you know, different wavelengths and intensities of light. Our, our, our systems can move, um, you can repurpose our systems within a day if you want to move from growing uh, lettuce to, I don't know, strawberries. And you can't do that with rigid bench systems. So really what we've tried to do from, um, I guess, um, architectural standpoint and the system standpoint is come up with a holistic uh, approach that addresses all of the, the major shortcomings. And um, there's an example of a, a, a system uh, that we're building at the minute. Um, and uh, yeah, if you, just, if you just obviously look around, you can see that what we've tried to do is effectively eliminate any um, resource intensive bottlenecks associated with uh, vertical farming systems. You know, we want vertical farming to create new jobs and opportunities, but there are clearly, you know, if, if, we, if we simply move traditional farming methods inside and, and don't address those bottlenecks, then we're faced with the exact same uh, issues, but a much higher um, capital investment. Uh, thanks. Okay, I think uh, just to, to carry on from that, um, I think the, uh, one of the questions I'd like to, to ask to, to clarify on that would be that, if I'm looking at your ability to grow, say, fresh produce, say leafy greens, in a vertical farming context, um, how does that compare economically to actually growing it in the field? Um, in the UK here, for example. Do you have any data on that, or are you...? 
so, so on, 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 on a small scale, it's not economical. I mean, it, it's, um, it, it doesn't make sense to compare a, a micro farm under, say, you know, a thousand or 2000 square meters with, with outdoor growing. I think the, the key value propositions for vertical farming so far have primarily focused on uh, reduced food miles, uh, freshness, uh, you know, less pesticides. I think the cost, the cost arguments still need to be proven. I think the, um, the, the energy consumption aspects of vertical farms are still holding the industry back. So we, we focus on a fractional LED based approach where we bring um, power consumption down by about 60%. And also the way that we've designed our farms means you have kind of a flatter uh, energy distribution. So you've got less peaks and troughs but that's holding the, the market back. So it's a long way of saying that, um, yeah, at, at, at small scale, it doesn't work. And in, indeed, at larger scale, um, it's still very, very tight. We're, we're still, I think, quite a, way, uh, quite a long way away from being able to have um, vertically farmed produce for, for leafy greens, you know, bag salads, uh, competing head to head um, on price uh, with traditional farms. We've, we've had a, a question coming in from the audience, which you want to just drop into. I know we were going to pick these a little bit later. Um, we're from uh, Diana saying that recent market studies have suggested that the market for microgreens is only 3% of the UK produce market. Uh, with lots more vertical farms, do you think that we're going to see that all being around microgreens, or do we feel that it's going to be a wider range of produce that's going to be coming forward? If you just do a really quick answer on that one, Rick. Sure, yeah, I mean, 3% actually sounds very high, but um, yeah, clearly not everybody's gonna eat microgreens. If everybody set up vertical farms focused on microgreens, then yeah, they can be profitable op operations. But I think it's, uh, it's wrong to assume that um, as a society, we're all gonna start suddenly uh, shifting our diets and only eating those. I mean, vertical farming needs to be proven on many levels, not just for microgreens. And, and obviously that's what we focus on from an R&D standpoint. Okay, so I think what we're looking at there is a, um, a situation where we've, we've made a start, but I think we're going to see a growth into a wide range of other areas. And, and uh, Oscar had made a comment on that to me about that. I'd like to go on now um, a little bit further and um, really find out um, what's happening from Chris in terms of the ability of society to in the UK to find out about what's happening in, in uh, vertical farms. And maybe by asking the question, uh, you know, what provision have we got in the UK uh, to have demonstration of urban farming? Yeah, thanks, Richard. That's, um, that's a really good question. Um, so if I could just set some, set some sort of background, if you like. So back in 2013, the UK launched its agri-tech strategy. And as part of that, it started to create four agri-tech centres here in the UK, um, which were going to be pioneering centres, and they really have proven to be. So here at 2020, seven years on, we are now seeing the sort of fruits of that labour, if that makes sense. So if, if I can just sort of focus on two of that, at those four centres, there's uh, one particular centre um, or network of centres known as AgriEpi, and that's Agricultural Engineering Precision Innovation, the epi bit. Um, and in a, in a world of... Um, urban agriculture, there's a lot of development going on there in terms of robotic picking and handling and all that sort of side of things. Um, there's an awful lot going on in that world. And here in the world of Innovate UK, um, if you've seen what's happening with the press and everything else, we've been the busiest, I think, we've ever been since our inception because we've channeled an awful lot of COVID support funding. And a lot of that money has been around supply chain issues. Um, which obviously things like urban farming, vertical farming, whichever way you want to look at it, is a solution to some of these issues. So that's where we have made those centres become very important in terms of connecting businesses, connecting solutions and ways forward. Um, the other particular centre is uh, the centre called CHAP, that's Ch uh, Crop Health and Protection. So that obviously looks at the growing of plants, um, the issues around um, uh, all the um, pesticides that are now getting banned, so how can we effectively manage all of that kind of stuff. But in terms of the world of urban agriculture and what they're doing in those particular centres to help develop that marketplace, um, within CHAP they've got a natural 
um, natural light growing centre. Um, this I understand to be the world's first natural light growing centre, which is linked with the University of Warwick Life Sciences, um, which is incredibly exciting. You know, this, this is world beating stuff that's going on in the UK. Um, a second uh, aspect of the CHAP um, centre network is the Innovation Hub for Controlled Environment Agriculture. Again, an awful lot of expertise in there because these centres all link with um, academia and they're there to really provide support to businesses as well. They're, they're growing membership, membership um, uh, bodies around them and they're, they're really looking to engage with industry. And another point just moving on, if I've got time, Richard, um, there's a vertical farming development centre that's being created connected with CHAP and that's located at Stockbridge Tech Centre and this is looking at the capabilities of the existing LED for crops um, facilities. Um, there's, there's so much going on that um, I could probably take up the rest of the um, session. I just wanted to sort of highlight some of the initiatives and, and where some of these centres are coming together. So there's a joint CHAP and AgriEpi um, initiative at the moment, looking at phenotyping, phenotyping um, which is taking place at Cranfield University. And what, what I think I'd, I'd urge anyone in, in perhaps the audience to do, if you've not engaged with these centres and you're into business or academia, looking at urban farming, looking at agri-tech, really do pick up with these centres because that's where an awful lot of expertise is, is focused at the moment to provide really innovative solutions for, for the, the problems we're starting to see. Thank you very much for that. Chris, I, I was going to ask you a question a bit later, but I think I want to bring it forward. And that is that, uh, you know, what is the nature of the support that these agri-tech centres can give to individuals who've got an interest? You've already suggested going and seeing what they're doing and finding out. But is there any way in which these centres are going to support actual uh, entrepreneurship and innovation on the ground in, in cities directly? I, I, I can't speak specifically for them. They, they've all got their own board of directors and everything like that. But um, I'm very minded from what I do know about them, that they are centres open for collaboration and they're centres for um, open access. So they've got some fantastic equipment in some of these places that people can go and see and can actually use to test some of their thinking at the moment. So they've got, um, in, in terms of vert vertical farming, the opportunity of, of matching rooms. So you can trial projects for um, lighting, for heat, for everything else that's going on with the testing of that particular idea. So I, I really encourage people to connect with them because although you might not find them in city centres at the moment, I think what they're trying to do is build that network. And you know, in, in the worlds we are today, where people aren't going out and about and um, you know, connecting and interacting. Um, there's a lot that can be done remotely and these centres are open, they are there to test, test new ideas. I think it's also good to see that um, higher education itself, uh, in addition to these key centres, there's a number of centres which are seeking to, in, uh, you know, to get involved with this. Um, I recently went and had a look at the uh, vertical farming unit at Brackenhurst under Nottingham Trent University from a Absolutely. university point of view, along with, uh, you know, a lot of universities like ourselves have our sort of innovation and, and pharma and food industry support centres. Uh, and also I uh, recently visited with a group of students when we were allowed to go out visiting places. We went down for the private sector, sort of Kingshay Centre down in Somerset, looking at uh, innovation and technology around the dairy industry. So I think, from, uh, I think for all of you in the audience, you need to find out what's happening locally to you. Uh, right. maybe, maybe Jamie and, and your group might be able to, uh, sorry, uh, Oscar, your group might be able to sort of, uh, you know, through connection with you, you find out what is happening on a more local area for people who are interested. So Jamie, I don't know if that's what you're, you do or not. You're on mute. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think I think that's definitely an area for collaboration for us, for sure. Yeah, and Oscar, do you have the same sort of communications that people can go to to find out what's happening more locally? Um, I don't at the moment. Um, however, I am working as in, well, it's it's on its way. I am working on a rooftop greenhouse hydroponics school, 
which yeah. will um, essentially go over the top of a uh, of an extension to an affordable artist studio block in East London. Mm -hmm. We're at pre-planning stage, so it's still <laughs> quite a way away. Um, and hopefully that will be um, where people can co come and learn how to grow, um, do blended learning courses with part online and part practical modules. Uh, and then um, spread the word organically, hopefully. Um, I mean, there will be no doubt the, the whole social media thing, which um, anyone who's been to my website probably sees that I'm terrible at. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, hopefully this will, you know, but I can't say that I'm doing it right now. But I know UK UAT does a lot, um, yeah. and I'm thankful for that. <laughs> I think it's always it's always good to try and find ways in which we can all network better. Um, Actually, Richard, I was just going to add, if I may. Um, yes, yeah, certainly. Everyone thinks about Innovate UK, you know, it's all about funding, it's all about loans, it's all about... Um, that side of things, but there's a major part of Innovate with its network partners. It does an awful lot of connecting. And uh, certainly the centers that I've mentioned earlier are fantastic at that. But also there's um, something called the Knowledge Transfer Network, um, yeah, yeah. which is funded. You guys probably all know about, but perhaps for some of the audience that don't, it's not just, there's a fantastic agri-food uh, KTN team, but there's also KTN teams about materials, advanced um, energy utilization, all sorts of different areas, but they are specialists and they are there to network across the UK, know where the, the best academic bases are in the UK, what's happening in urban, regional and, and local areas as well. So I, I really recommend engaging with that KTN network, but again, they are funded by Innovate UK uh, to the greater extent and uh, a, a great resource. I think I'd like to go on to uh, just broaden the argument a little bit further or broaden the debate a little bit further. Jamie, I'd like to come back to you. Um, and I'd like to really ask the question, we've had a little bit of conversation about the benefits and, and what can be there. Are there any sort of wider social benefits that you feel comes from having uh, the food system close to the consumers in, in, in the city um, in any way? I think, yeah, I think from a, from a learning and education standpoint and, and a net job creation standpoint, clearly there are, uh, there are benefits to be had there. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think the closer food production is to the point of consumption, the more you could argue that there's greater transparency, um, you know, traceability. People are more and more focused on provenance uh, these days. So... Um, so yeah, I think I, I I do think it's a good thing, and I think that there are much wider benefits to, to be had than than these kind of um, you know carbon based and uh, kind of broader economic based arguments. Good, and then just again looking at these wider issues, uh, going on to Oscar, um, in terms of food production in the cities, do you think we've got any particular problems to address in terms of the uh, climatic challenges, where the cities are going to be hotter than the rural areas? and potential pollution, in particular atmospheric pollution, and maybe a contamination of water that might be being used for irrigation uh, without having made, I'm talking more about the, the low the low tech urban agriculture that may create health problems, for example. Now you're on mute. We're talking about um, the sort of advanced cities with, um, you know, mature, utilities and infrastructure then you know those those um risks are, are, are sort of mit like mitigated yeah um if, if you're talking about um you know cities in the developing world well there's a lot of urban agriculture there already yeah, yeah. so if you look at dar es salaam it's one of the biggest centers of urban agriculture where people are growing the best example the one that should be I mean, we should really examine much more closely is the Cuban example in the 90s when they lost their Soviet Union oil imports. So that uh, is the, I mean, again, that, that, that example tells us, okay, if we, if we have to transition away from fossil fuels, that's how you do it. Um, so pollution. Yes. Okay. Pollution, again, if we're talking about China um, and, and the sort of amount of coal that's up in the air and the amount of uh, pollutants, yeah, it's, it, it's going to be an issue, but you can design and you can mitigate against those things. 
Again, if you were to sort of um, introduce rooftop greenhouses into uh, the urban, uh, the built environment, then to some degree, you're already doing a lot of that work. Now, yeah. the big question for like regarding pollution is, well, how much better is it than um, in rural environments where uh, pesticides and herbicides are applied liberally? Um, and the best kind of um, sort of illustration of it is the sort of rise in popularity of urban honey which if you measure it against rural honey will have a much lower um, sort of nasties content um, simply because um, urban environments are regulated um, to avoid having a, sort of any pesticides or, or, or herbicides being used in them not fully might I add um, anyone who's been on sort of local neighborhood chat forums complaining about the use of glyphosates in, uh, in, in parks will testify, but it's a lot better than what happens currently in a lot of industrial agriculture. Um, okay. So again, as with everything to do with, uh, with, with, with urban agriculture, it's all in the design. Um, and we have the knowledge, we have the know-how, and we definitely have the technology. It just depends on the market and the will. Yeah, I think that's interesting. I, I your first response to is when you were talking about the technology and you said everything from the sort of balcony to the to the green space. I guess we're looking at a situation where uh, you know the atmospheric pollution uh, within a within an urban context is not a problem for the high tech system, but for the lower tech systems, it could potentially be a problem. Um, so I think that that's one thing we need to recognise in that. And I'm glad you mentioned Q, but it's the way I actually hook my students on what is urban and peri-urban. And also mm. I try and stimulate people to think about agricultural policy, embracing the urban context, which very few countries in the world do. So it's just a, an observation on that. I mean, one of the, one of the oddest ones that I've found about is, is the dacha culture in Russia. Um, yeah. So people's sort of second home where they sort of grow stuff and, and, and Russia is particularly cold. So, uh, and you wouldn't think that they'd grow their own food, but they do. Um, so it's it's already out there. Um, it just, I, I guess, it just needs a, a more enabling environment, and it needs a bit more uh, design thinking to go into it to really, really fly. Okay, uh, I'd like to go now back to Peter. Uh, Peter, in your um, presentation, your video, you were talking about your cows, and they can wander to have a little exercise in their in their meadows. I really want to just ask you, how, how do residents in Rotterdam feel about these cows? Uh, and, and have you had any complaints about how you're treating with their waste? Uh, but also thirdly, uh, what is the risk of, um, when you've got animals and people together, there's a risk of, you know, sort of zoonotic diseases transferring. So really it's around what, the, what the, the residents think of the cows in the city, what about the smells and what about disease? I think the three related questions there, I hope you can maybe address some of those. You don't uh, mean? Yeah, 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 sorry, for sure. So, so um, when, we, when we were chasing the, the permit to do this, that was really difficult. So we have to uh, comply with all kinds of uh, criteria on waste and smell. And the funny stuff is that, that the, the authorities asked me, uh, Peter, do, do you think we smell the farm? Uh, I said, yeah, well, of course we smell the farm. What, what's wrong with the smell of a farm? I mean, we are, are here in the biggest petrochemical port of the world almost. And we're used to petrochemicals, chemicals and stuff like that. And we say, do we smell the farm? Of course we smell the farm, it's, it's perfect. But so it is limited, that, that, that's make that one thing for sure. So one of the questions is what do we do with the waste? Well. The, the waste, we call it manure, we call it a fertilizer for the parks and the plants. So we collect the manure, we don't put it in a tank, but we collect it immediately and we process it within three hours. We split it into urine and we split it into dry matter. And mm -hmm. both is very interesting material to feed back to the cities. So the urine, we take out the water and the salts is the leftover we use for the plant and the plant growth. The same goes for the dry matter. We have a contract with the city of Rotterdam, but we also sell it over here to the, uh, to the neighbors, the people who live in the city. They use it for their balcony parks, balcony plants and stuff like that. So it's completely circular. So uh, it starts with the residual streams that we collect from the city, goes to the cows, they produce protein and manure, and that goes back in the city. 
That's also maybe related to the second question. What do you think of the local people uh, about our farm? And that was a, an earlier question about socializing with your environment. And what we see happening over here that we are almost a social enterprise. People come over here, they take the children, they want to taste the real product. We don't add anything to it. They want to make new products with it because it's original. It's locally produced. They see the farmer, they see the animals, they see the product, everything within 50 or 100 meters. Uh, so it, it's, it's a total new engagement. People tell me, they say, it does remind me of the early days when the products were original and natural and organic. So they start making new products again and they share the stories. They have tastings, they organize tastings on our location over here with their, the products they make from all our products. So there's a new thing happening. It's, I don't know the English word for it, but there's something new happening. Maybe it's the word socializing, I'm not sure, but yeah. we're very proud on that one. Um, I think, I, think um, I had two, uh, sorry, Richard. Yeah, the other one was around the, you know, with cattle close to humans, whether there's any risk of zoonotic disease. Training. Ah, yeah. No, Which this is one of the uh, elements that is also, uh, uh, it's very strict over here, very strict in, in our country. Uh, we are yeah. now designing number two. So there will be a farm next door if we get the permit. And that will be with uh, chickens. And um, so we are selling eggs actually yeah. and, uh, and vegetables. But uh, these questions about so and those are more uh, more uh, applied to the chicken thing, so not with yes. the cows actually. Yeah, the salmon and our encampment back to challenges would be quite great. I'll, I'll be interested when you come to plan your third farm with the pigs in it. <laughs> well, okay. Sorry, Richard. Uh, just on zoonotic spillover, which should be yeah. on everyone's tongue given COVID. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, 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 the key point there is how s are the cows stressed? Um, and it's, it comes down to packing densities and, and again, design. So if the cows aren't stressed, then supposedly um, their immune system is strong enough to contain those pathogens. Yeah. And they don't spill over and they don't become um, issues. Now, I don't know if councils are you know, hip to it. <laughs> if they understand the process, they, they, they probably need to invite an epide epidemiologist in to sort of, yeah. you know, educate them. Um, but then again, you know, planning is, uh, and, 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 and permissions are, are deliberately slow incremental um, systems um, because um, the risks are very high and the damage can be um, extraordinary. Okay. I think going on from that, um, I had a question from Diana. It's a question I would also like to ask, and that is, again, within the designs of these, when you're bringing in organic material of whatever source to into into the the, the system, um, what is the potential value of using anaerobic digestion to get both nutrient and uh, energy recovery, and also maintaining temperatures that would actually uh, reduce the risk of the zoonotic bacteria microorganisms moving forward? I don't know if anyone would like to comment on. Uh, for example, well, first of all, Peter, would AD feature in your uh, type of design, perhaps? What does the AD stand for? Anaerobic digestion. Uh, okay, no, no. What we do here is uh, we split the um, the manure, mm -hmm. as I mentioned in, in dry matters and in uh, yeah. urine. So we do uh, reverse osmosis to 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 take out the water of the urine. Yeah. And so we have clean water. So that's not, and the um, the yeah, the dry matter we need to hydrogenate so we heat it up and we press it into pellets small yep. parts and that's all according to the uh, rules over here the regulations over here yeah yep. so we don't use that uh, technology uh, does anyone else in the panel want to comment on the role of it oscar so yeah i looked into this um very interested in it because obviously it closes the loop so when i was yep. um working on sort of rooftop greenhouses in various places in, in London. Um, I did connect with CAB Energy, who do sort of containerized anaerobic digestion yep. containers. You put it in one end and out the other yep. end, you get a uh, digestate, which is a sludge, highly yep. nutrient, uh, highly nutritious sludge that you can throw on fields and, and, and do wonderful things with. Um, uh, synthetic gas, uh, yep. um, which uh, you can burn and then you can generate energy. 
Um, uh, and uh, it's, it would be great if that digestate could, uh, I mean, you know, you can apply it to soil-based growing. That's absolutely fine. Um, application to, um, say, water-based growing is slightly more complicated. Yeah, sure, yeah. It is possible, <laughs> but um, water-based growing tends to like to be very sterile or very clean. Mm. Uh, few, like, you don't want... Um, too many bits and particulates getting into the cogs of the, yeah, the system yeah. that you're dealing with. The air pump, for example, you don't want to have to go in and dig it out and clean yeah. it too many times because it just becomes a bit of a pain. But what you can do with uh, digestate is dilute it and then filter it. And yeah. I mean, uh, farmers will know about compost tea, for example, which is as it infers, <laughs> you essentially create a sort of uh, a nutrient solution by sort of allowing the nutrients to diffuse into the liquid, but then you want to extract all the particulates. Um, and so uh, AD probably does have a role. Now, a few factors, it does smell, uh, but that can be mitigated as well. Uh, again, all a question of design. The way to do that is with a carbon filter. Now, the big issue with AD is um, permissions, uh, especially if you're going to sell the food. Mm. So there is a um, piece of uh, regulation called the PAS 110, yeah. which is a um, specification for uh, digestate that can be used for food that is then grown to sell. Um, and within that, there are restrictions on what the feedstock to the AD process could be. Um, so if it's food waste, I think you're in good territory. If it's, um, you know, if it's vegetables, I mean, it, anything that's already been through the system is largely okay, but, um, there are restrictions and there is an onus on the user to make sure that what goes in is, is okay to get yeah. the certification that you need, I, which is also quite I, expensive. Yeah, I, I think if anyone's interested in AD and the module unit size, I particularly like designs of things that fit into a container unit because it means mm. you can go anywhere. Uh, I think University of Southampton have got a, a, a container unit AD looking at food waste and green waste as a, an area there as a demonstration. Um, I think one thing we need to do now is maybe open up some questions uh, from the audience. Um, I'm going to just pick a couple of those up and pick them as we go through. Um, the first one I can probably answer, it was a, a, an anonymous question, you know, thanking for the seminar, but also saying what, uh, what are the best plants to grow? If I'm assuming this is someone that wants to be looking at doing it at their own level or at whatever, my view to that would be to start by looking at salad crops and leafy greens because it's a, it's a quick turnaround, you get immediate pleasure from the enjoyment of that. And then as you, learn, as you build your skills, you can probably move on to other aspects of it. Um, and I'm getting nodding for most of the panel, so I think we'll carry on with that one. There's a specific uh, question for Jamie from uh, Peter Lane. We really wanted to know uh, really what is the, the power, the current wattage per meter squared uh, that you are having to apply to be able to grow crops? Um, yeah, yeah, what, what is the energy demand on your system? I don't know that off the top of my head. I'm not touching that question. Uh, that would be yeah. for my engineers. Um, yeah, okay. Peter, if you want to send us a separate message, I'm happy to put you in touch. Uh, with Paul or Darren from our engineering team and we can answer that question but we've got all that data. That'd be good, thank you very much. And also there's a question that uh, I don't know who could answer this one, probably Chris. Uh, has any of the vertical farms received any support from the state like EU funds or other forms of support? Okay, um, so I, I don't know if we're talking about the centres I was explaining but um, what I do know, and I, I, apologies Jamie, I don't know personally about your business, but I do know, for example, where I'm based down here in the southwest of England, um, there's an organisation called Let Us Grow, and they're developing lots of things in, in vertical farming, in aeroponics, and they received um, several Innovate UK grants. Um, and yes, I believe there are organisations out there that have been in receipt of Horizon 2020 funds and other European funds. And, and don't forget that we still are paying in to Europe and we are yeah. still eligible to apply for some of these funds. So if that was directed at, could we possibly apply and get some funding, then 
potentially you still can and uh, both the European and UK innovation um, funds are, are available. Typically not for capital expenditure, um, it is all about research and development. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm just looking down through the, uh, the Zoom chat. I think we've addressed most of the issues. We've talked about energy and where we can get on to get more advice onto that. Um, yeah, I want to just now maybe um, just a final check on the, uh, the chat to make sure there's no more questions there and Q&A. Um, yeah, well, I think we've addressed all of those questions. So I think what I'd like to do now uh, as we get in towards the end of the session is to really uh, ask each panelist whether they want to reflect on um, you know, how this webinar has gone and, and what they're getting from it. And that allowed me to do the same at the end as well. So if I go, first of all, Jamie, how have you felt about this webinar? Do you feel you've had a chance to express your views and uh, had some nice perspectives? Yeah, I think it's great. I think uh, it's just, a sh yeah, it's a shame we have to do everything over the internet. Um, and it's always a bit, a bit short. And it's always difficult looking down the list trying to figure who's, uh, who's watching and interacting. But uh, I, I, I definitely think that uh, this sector is, um, is one where you know, we should be collaborating and talking to each other and um, sharing insights. So just a, a shout out to Innovate UK. You know, we, we've been involved, um, we've, we've won a couple of uh, grants there as well. And that's allowed us to, to, to work with uh, different companies in, in different parts of the sector. So the more of these uh, groups that we can have, the better. So thanks. Yeah, Oscar, how are you feeling about the webinar and, and what we've gone through? Mute. You're on mute, Oscar. <laughs> He's not picking up. Oscar, you're on mute. Sorry. Um, <laughs> let me do that. Let me do that bit again. Okay. Uh, too short. This. Uh, <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Two hours, probably about right. Maybe even three hours. Hell, why not go for four? Um, there's a lot of content to go through. We could have, you know, re really gotten into the weeds, which would have been a lot of fun. Um, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's always good to talk about these things. Good, thank you. Peter, thank you for joining us from the Netherlands. How, how have you felt about this webinar and, and uh, what have you got from it yourself? Well, very interesting uh, to, to meet other people in the same sector and uh, with the same thoughts, uh, I think. Uh, we're all parallel in, in, in finding new ways to feed the cities and uh, it's good to see the technologies and the ideas about this and um, looking forward to next steps. Uh, so uh, compliments to the organization to organize this one and um, would really love to, to come over to the UK to see if we can help you guys to do something on the water maybe uh, to Brilliant. produce some food over there. Thank you. I'm, d I'm doing some uh, local food models working with uh, uh, clients in China and, and one of those is on water so I might talk to you again. Chris, um, have you felt this has been a useful platform for you for Innovate UK? Absolutely, absolutely and apologies to Jamie I should have done a bit more homework it's been a little bit wall-to-wall -wall recently but um, thank you for the plug Jamie. Um, yeah no absolutely and uh, you know I'm, I'm overly enthusiastic about the sector I think there's lots of opportunity here you know it's, it's sustainability, um, net zero, is what we've all got to be working for. And, uh, you know, we need to just keep pushing these messages. Good. Um, I have to say just on that, that uh, I've done two applications of Innovate UK and I still haven't been successful yet. So I must talk to you again and find out where I'm going wrong. But uh, they were a few years ago, about three or four years ago. So uh, that's an interesting. I'd like to just sum up on a couple of points that, that uh, uh, resonated with me. Um, you know, because I, I, I'm, I'm fairly well in touch with most of this, but uh, just an observation. We talked about the fact that two thirds of the world population are going to be urban in the future, but there was a mega study done, uh, a meta analysis study done a, a, probably about five years ago, and it actually recognized that something like two thirds of all the cropland in the world is within 20 kilometers of urban centers, uh, which would, would suggest that local food models, the urban peri urban relationship, should work yet we are dominated by a global food model where we're moving food all around the world. I mean, we, we've doubled food production since World War II, but we've actually increased interborder trade 12-fold. You know, what are we doing? 
you know, who is who is actually preventing us from going towards this local model? I think a lot of it is us as consumers, but also I think the the existing supply chains are, may see this vertical, urban, local as a challenge to to their dominance of the food system, and that might be part of the debate we need to uh, to look at. So those are my thoughts. On it um, I found it most enjoyable, and uh, I just going to check if any of the panelists want to come back on anything just in the last uh, couple of minutes we got or last minute or so are we all okay uh, Oscar just, 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 uh, just to share your pain um, I, I also <laughs> uh, did two Innovate UK uh, unsuccessful bids um, but you know I'm sure there'll be another one within my lifetime um, but yeah no as you said um, somehow we're getting the pricing wrong um, people do talk yeah. about true cost accounting uh, we're not factoring in the externalities of production um, and, and again because we stretched out towards this a global economy uh, I guess we're trying to figure things out but we, we may have gone a bit too far um, more than anything it's the trans the, the transport bit is quite in, like relevant uh, I mean if it's cheaper to move food four times around the world rather than grow it on your doorstep um, then you know there's something wrong with the carbon pricing um and if carbon is the you know the the, the kind of fuel of, of mobility yeah. um that's that's kind of the center of the problem um so very much as you said you know by just eliminating that just saying no <laughs> enough um we are in a sense sort of uh, uh you know trying to get us off that oil addiction and like any addiction it's, it's going to be painful. I think as well, uh, just to sum up, that uh, I think we're in a unique opportunity at the moment in that uh, you know, going back to normal uh, post-COVID may not necessarily what we need to do, particularly in relation to food. Uh, and also a concern on the other hand is that if we are ultra successful in creating food production within the cities, are we actually denying economic activity in the rural communities? And if we're looking at a more circular food system, maybe the system is about connecting rural communities with urban communities through food at least within a local level where you can create that circularity of nutrient energy food food waste green waste recycling uh, and that's an area that particularly interests me in my research is how we create those those connections and it's also one where you start to people see each other as human beings and you start to trust each other and although we're looking at virtual faces it, it's nice to have got to know all of you and your views on this. Um, so I think we're really coming to the end of what we can do. So I, I will turn over to now to David to uh, try and sum up what we've been doing. I found it a fascinating session um, and um, I do feel that we haven't quite gone far enough. Uh, Dave, before I hand over, there was a comment about this was too short. I'm just wondering that maybe in the future something like this might benefit from having a, a session like this followed by some breakout rooms where people could go and talk about what they're interested in and then some bringing it back and maybe over a two, two hour, but maybe not a four hour session, it'd be something worth doing. But I'll leave you with that to consider within the organization. Uh, thank you very much for asking me to moderate. I very much enjoyed it. Over to you, David. Thank you very much to, uh, to you, Richard, for your moderation and to all of our panelists for their expert discussion. I found it personally very fascinating because it's not an area that I know very much about. And I can see from the questions and the chat that's been going on, it's also stimulated um, a lot of discussion and interconnection between, uh, between people. So I thank uh, you all for joining this event to our panelists, uh, Richard, the moderator, and um, all of uh, our delegates. I'm now going to bring this uh, webinar to a close. And just to remind you that when you leave this webinar, you will uh, be uh, prompted to fill in a questionnaire. We'd much appreciate if you could just take a couple of minutes uh, to fill in that questionnaire. Uh, our next webinar um, is on Thursday the 15th of October at the same time, 2 p.m. UK time. Uh, and it's going to be on the topic of reinventing the high street, uh, which is also extremely topical at the moment with the impact of lockdown and some of the restrictions relating to uh, coronavirus. So thank you all once again for joining this afternoon. Uh, please log off and complete the questionnaire when you leave. Thank you.